<clears throat> All right, good evening. Welcome to the October 28, 2019 Newton Town Council meeting. If everyone could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Ms. Reed, if you please take a roll call. Mr. Dixon? Here. Mrs. Diglio? Here. Mr. Lynn? Here. Mr. Glover? Here. Mayor Here. Here. In accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, notice of this regular meeting was given to the two newspapers record and posted on the official bulletin board on January 4th, 2019. In your agenda, you received October 16, 2019, regular meeting minutes. Uh, I believe that there have been some corrections that were submitted. Very minor one. Okay. Any other additions, changes, deletions? I did not get to go over that. Corrections. Any others? Okay. Can I have a motion on the minutes, please? I'll make a motion to approve the October 16, 2019, regular minutes. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion by Councilwoman Diglio, a second by Councilman Dixon. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Dixon? Yes. Mrs. Diglio? Yes. Mr. Flynn? Yes. Mr. Schlaffer? Yes. Mayor Lafoy? Yes. Okay. At this point in the meeting, the Town Council welcomes comments from any member of the public on any topic to help facilitate an orderly meeting and to permit the opportunity for anyone who wishes to be heard. Speakers are asked to take one turn at the microphone and please limit their comment to five minutes. The clerk will keep time. If reading from a prepared statement, please provide a copy and email a copy to the clerk's office after making your comments so it may be properly reflected in the minutes. The council may choose to comment after the entire public portion has concluded. Okay. I'm Maureen Snellen. I live on Plainfield Avenue. I'm here today to speak about the town manager, Tom Russo. It's my understanding that he has been the town manager for 11 years now. I also understand that his contract with the town is up at the end of this year. Although I appreciate his service to the community, I think we are due for someone new with some fresh ideas. I'm here today to speak for myself, but there is a community group that has been getting together for meetings several times a week talking about the town manager and the town council, about how the town needs a change to move forward into the future. So I am not alone with the idea that we need some fresh ideas and someone new to go forward. I suspect there will be several people speaking tonight wanting to wanting and asking our council to work in our best interest to start advertising and interviewing for some potential new town managers. I'm not going to stand here and point out all the things that went wrong with the job that was done, although others may do that. I just want to move forward in the best interest of my town. I've been here since 1986. I've raised four children here, and this is their home town. I love the town of Newton, and I'm, I have high hopes for the future. We, at this time, still have 24 storefronts vacant on Spring Street, which saddens me. Many merchants have left Spring Street because they are having issues with the town hall. I have a copy here of the newspaper article of one such merchant that lists some of the problems he was having while he was in business here on Spring Street. This gentleman was an asset to the community. He brought many people from all over New Jersey and also from out of state. He created a lot of foot traffic on Spring Street, which helped the eateries in town as well. There are many others that have left as well one reason or another most of the complaints that the Newton Town Hall would not work with them turning Spring Street into a one way for people to leave they knew it would hurt their business another when Union Place was closed for a prolonged amount of time which absolutely killed their business someone brought to my attention recently that there's tables and chairs in front of the Caldwell building the new Caldwell building I was shocked to hear this so I went down to see for myself I know two merchants that always put small things out in front of their businesses to show that they were open, and they were told it wasn't allowed. Told nothing was allowed to be out there in front of their building or on the sidewalk at any time. I'd like to know when this law or ordinance had been changed. I'm not complaining. I think Spring Street looks great decorated. Newton Town Hall is known not to be merchant friendly. That was loud and clear to them. Them. Moving on, we have to continue issuing, we, we have continued issues down at Memory Park, which, which needs correcting. I'm grateful for the Newton Town Pool being saved, but I certainly hope we come in under budget for that. Going forward, I am definitely not alone with feeling that our town manager should live within the town of Newton. At the very least, he should live here in the county. 
We have wonderful people here that live in Newton. We have a large sense of community here, and not having our town manager part of that is really kind of sad. Des decisions made here are, are, affecting, are not affecting him personally or his family. You as our council represent us. You hired the town manager, and he works for you, and it sure doesn't seem that way. That needs to be corrected going forward. As I've said, this is, there is a community group that has come together that's having regular meetings, and I will tell you that there is a lot of chatter about changing the form of government here in town. I personally don't want to see that happen. But if things don't change and work the way they're supposed to, the people of Newton are paying attention, are watching, and we are not going to let this happen any longer. Thank you. Which I live at 184 Main Street. Uh, I was here last meeting uh, about the problem I have with the brook running through my property, and it's gotten worse after a couple of days' rain. Uh, I, uh, I walked the uh, brook today, and uh, with all the rain, well, it hasn't been a lot of rain, but it, it was quick. The, it's solid uh, muck and everything in there. Uh, the brook itself has at least five areas of sand and gravel that cover the ditch, and there's what was four, three or four foot wide is now a foot. In my yard, it's even worse. Uh, I also complained about people throwing their uh, cuttings, leaves and things in, in the brook itself. And that's gotten worse. I uh, was told that they would check it, and nobody's checked it because the one guy at six uh, Barrett is adding on to his six foot pile with his leaves this morning or this afternoon. I mean, it's getting worse and worse. Uh, and I also said that there were three tributaries going in that brook, and I went to the other side. I went over to uh, West End, West Nelson. And I went in there, and I was also, I've been told many stories that the water comes from the uh, quarry up on the uh, West End. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, but there was a brook. They told me there's a, a pond there that's been there forever. It's dried out. But now, when I was there now, there's an indentation where the brook was. It is a brook again, or a pond again. It's, and that is one of the tributaries that are running down coming from that area where the, uh, what used to be a uh, pond, the water, there's water in there, and there's also a small brook running maybe 50 feet from there into the main thing. Uh, the only thing I ask today, I don't know what's going on, what decisions have been made. I, I think you have gotten a report from the surveyor's office, and he made a couple suggestions. One of them was, to uh, have the code or whatever people notify the people who are throwing the, the uh, debris in the in the brook itself. That hasn't been done. I don't think anybody's even looked at it. The drain go that comes across the street from the high school is back with leaves. It, they were there once. I, I saw once since I've been two years on Ryerson Avenue. That drain has leaves on it. it also today, when I went by, they have two metal, about that big around, two metals just sitting right on top of that drain. Now, I don't know who's checking that or whatever, but, you know, I'm really up to here. The uh, one rain we had in the night, we uh, ended up with a, our crawl space was half full. It's only like four foot. There was two foot of water there, had gone over the bank. 
I have a couple pictures here. It not only ran over the bank there, but it went from uh, just after it comes into our property. It went to the right and uh, down uh, in right hand corner, right on 206. We had two foot of or a foot of water that had gone over the bank there, and it's just getting ridiculous. I haven't touched it since I've talked to you, but it's the pond right on down our 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 brook, and also where it goes underneath. There's a uh, pipe, four foot pipe, and that's got that much sand, and then everything's backing up there too. And I'd, I'd like to know if. Thing, what are you, you suggested that I do, or, or what are you going to do, or whatever? Okay, we'll look for an update. Thank you, Mr. Talmadge. Pardon me? We'll look for an update uh, after all the comments. Thank you. Take your time. Sorry. Hi, I'm Bonnie Pachando. I'm the owner of Maxwell and Molly's Closet, proudly on Spring Street in Newton. We've been there for 12 and a half years. We are very, very uh, invested in this town, both monetarily and time-wise, my, both my husband and myself. Um, and our business has flourished here in this town. It has had some... Uh, issues that go on that um, put strains on our business and one I will be speaking of tonight I've actually been speaking of it for a number of years to no, no avail and that is the closing of the street for different events I know it is a wonderful thing for some of the businesses but not for all of the businesses I've worked very hard and spent a lot of money to come uh, um, to develop a clientele for my business through advertising on TV, the radio, the newspapers, Facebook, flyers, my own special events that do not close down the street. And when you close down the street, my customers that I have paid dearly for and have worked very hard for cannot get to my store. And it's usually on Saturday, the day they're off from work. So I would ask you kindly I know many events are um, very helpful to some of the businesses but some of them the street does not have to be closed it can be done individually or with a small group of stores an example is the most wonderful event I think um, the uh, dining event what's it called what's the name taste of Newton of course it's a wonderful event it brings a lot of lovely people to the street but it is only down the other end of the street. It doesn't come to um, three quarters of Spring Street, yet the entire street is closed. That Monday, our store sits there with barricades at both ends. Nobody can get to my store all day. So I would just ask that you be very cognizant of the fact that um, the number of times you close Spring Street, why you're closing Spring Street, um, no one's like even engaging me with your eyes. I, I feel I'm like I'm talking to a wall. Yeah, we're, all take, we're all taking notes. Okay, great. Um, I just ask you to be cognizant of the fact that it does hurt some of the businesses and to take that into account the number of times and the amount of time that you close the street. I know I would be very grateful for that, and so with my with my customers that have to sometimes walk four and five blocks with a 35 pound bag of dog food. Um, they are important to me. They are the sustenance of our business and it looks like you're starting to close the street on average of once a month. That takes from my business a couple of thousand dollars and I would like to know if you would like a couple of thousand dollars taken from your business or your livelihood once a month. Thank you.
James Hoff, 37, Dumas Drive. <clears throat> As Mr. Russo's contract is due to expire at the end of the year, many people of Newton have concerns that may concern you as well. As our elected representatives, I urge you to consult and poll your constituents before entering into another multi-year deal with Mr. Russo. So I have about two and a half pages here of things that uh, I've, I've come to understand. And so um, I just would like to pass this off to the council members to consider and put under your uh, review. And um, there are some things here that, uh, as, as we started learning more and more, um, to me, they were very concerning and very alarming. And I would ask that you uh, put some careful thought into what's going to happen here for our community moving forward. Um, uh, I'm most concerned with the amount of time that he's in a community, and uh, it seems like he's got a lot of other things on his plate in other in other areas that don't uh, don't happen in Newton, and that's my I think that's probably my biggest concern. So I'll share this with the council members and ask that you review it. And um, I feel like that's probably enough for now. Thank you. Any other comments at this time? No other public comments? Okay. We move on to council manager reports. A couple of updates. Uh, happy birthday, Deputy Mayor Flynn, first of all. Um, on the 23rd, we had two events going on. Um, Deputy Mayor Flynn and I were both in attendance at the plan board meeting. Um, and Councilman Diglio and I attended the Sass County Economic Development Symposium um, and Mayor's Dinner. Uh, um, it's always interesting to get together with the rest of the municipalities to talk about, about economic development in the county. Uh, very pleased with, um, so there were really two municipalities, I think, that we agree were um, really leading the county in economic development, one being uh, Sparta with their, the same day they had the grand opening of their new um, project up on night four. Um, but the town of Newton, we had seven things that we discussed in terms of economic development and I'm going to pull those notes um, to come back to you in a second but um, I think Councilwoman Diglio, to, Councilwoman Diglio will also to attest to the fact that um, many of the other towns talked about what was going on in some of the bigger municipalities whether it be Hope, Hakong, Sparta, Newton, Franklin all impacting greatly um, and in a welcome way what was going on in their municipalities um, and there were towns like Vernon and Stillwater and Andover Township, Andover Borough, and others that talked about the things that were happening in kind of the nucleus points of the county, um, greatly impacting in a positive way their municipalities as well. A couple of reminders of uh, some things coming up. Uh, Halloween, the parade this year is going to start at 6 o'clock instead of 5 o'clock. It's an hour later, obviously. Um, again, starting on Union and Lower Spring Street with the parade escorted by the Newton Fire Department coming up and around to the parking lot across the street. Um, all age groups, all groups are, are welcome. I believe that we'll have some folks that are probably doing some trunk or treating, um, and certainly the Moose Lodge of the fire department continues to sponsor that event. So we hope that the weather holds out and that there will be lots of people in attendance. Um, coming up on November 9th, there are two things. We have the Rabies Clinic down at DPW, so I know the clerk's office um, is uh, planning that as a service to uh, folks in town that need to have um, their dogs brought in, and then soon after that, I know the clerk's office will all be sending out the reminders um, in terms of rabies certificates and licenses that will be uh, due by, by the end of the year. Also on that day at 11 a.m. is our Flags of Honor ceremony here at Town Hall. Um, flags are still available for 
a donation of thirty dollars. Um, as a reminder, you can um, make a donation, all of which is going to the Community Hope uh, Foundation, which has a plethora of veterans services including housing mental health services um, walk-in services and um, we encourage uh, folks to come out also for, for the ceremony but also to purchase a flag or make a donation of a flag for someone in their family it's a current service member former military um, really anyone uh, so we're looking forward to an event that day of which we have many people in the community that will be involved um, congratulations to uh, Plan Board Vice Chair Gary Marion on his nuptials. I was happy to do that ceremony uh, last week. Much, many years of uh, uh, happiness and health to him and his new bride as well. He was at the uh, planning board meeting, so I think they defer their, their honeymoon for some reasons. Um, while I'm pulling on those other count comments, uh, Mayor Flynn, move on to you. I have nothing at this time. Councilwoman Diglio. Okay. On October 17th, I attended the Sussex County League of Municipalities meeting. Um, Marvin J. Josh, who also had done a presentation at our last council meeting, um, did a presentation on, uh, the, spe on um, the importance of the census and how the info is used. Uh, Jeff Perot, the county clerk, gave a presentation on the duties of his office, and Gary Gitano, the county surrogate, discussed the various fu functions of his office. On October October 22nd, I attended a meeting with the Market Street Mission, which is interested in opening a location in the Newton area. October 23rd, I attended the Sussex County Economic Development Symbolium with Mayor uh, Lafar. And yesterday, I attended Pastor Frank Leone's last sermon at the Christ Community Church. As many of you know, Pastor Frank has been in the community as the head of the Christ Community Church, I believe it's for 17 years. Um, and he is going to be missed. He is very much involved in the church, in the community, and uh, he'll be missed. That's about it. Councilman Schlaffer? Nothing for me this time. Councilman Dixon? Uh, there's no board of the meeting to report on, but I did want to recognize some achievements by some of the high school fall sports teams. So congratulations to Newton girls tennis team on winning their division title. Um, congratulations to the girls soccer team on clinching a division title in an overtime win against Kittatinny, and lastly, congratulations to the Newton varsity football team for clinching a share of the SFC National Red Division, and that's their third straight division uh, title. So congratulations to all the kids that are involved with those uh, athletics. And the next board of bed meeting, do you have? <laughs> oh, way to put me on the spot. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> November 12th. November 12th. November 12th. Okay. Mr. Russo? Uh, just a couple things. One, um, Ms. Leo is working with code enforcement on outreach regarding the issue Mr. Talmadge brought up. Um, Ms. Ursula has been working with Bernie on that to you know, probably send out a notice to the property owners in the general vicinity to let them know that they shouldn't be disposing of their accumulated leaf piles in a certain fashion and that there's a more proper way to handle that. NDPW is working on the drainage inlets, piping outlets on Ryerson. So those are the two things that we can do. We have a copy of the memo from Harold's office, so Ursula will follow up on the code enforcement, and I'll keep tabs with Kenny and Adam on both works for you guys. So that was the issue on that. I uh, appreciate Bonnie's comments on the street closing, and you know, there's always that balance between community, communal interest versus individual, but I agree with you about Taste of Newton, maybe restructuring that since, you know, needed a much smaller footprint than it was taking up, so I agree with that. Um, I disagree overall because we haven't really added any new events since really the fall festival four years ago. I know we're doing an additional two hours of closing after the holiday parade, but absent that, there's no plans on adding any new events because of you know concerns that you've raised over the years. Um, I think we have a pretty good allotment of um, events, and that's why with, you know the events that we've added, we've added down at Memory Park to you know keep commerce going on spring so those are the two issues there mayor brought up a Halloween parade for Thursday six o'clock hope to see everyone there our new CFO Monica you met last meeting starts on Friday uh, mayor mentioned about the rabies clinic that's 9 a.m. Uh, the 9th uh, flags of honor looking forward to that 11 a.m. on the 9th we are closed Veterans Day November 11th our next council meeting will be Wednesday November 13th because of that and don't forget Get the chamber meet and greet here Thursday, November 
That's at 4.30, from 4.30 to 6 here at Town Hall. That's it. Thank you, ma'am. So, Mr. Talmadge, I want to make sure that you heard the two follow-up steps that are happening. So, okay. So, our town attorney is working on a letter um, with code enforcement to go out to the neighbors all around that are contributing to the leave problem. And then number two, um, DPW is working on the drainage issues up on Ryerson, the ones that you pointed out. So both in process. Okay. Um, so let me come back. To, I just found my notes about the 2019 year in review that we provided at the um, uh, Sussex County Economic Development Committee meeting. So we, um, there were only a couple of towns um, in the entire county that were able to promote a zero budget tax increase of which we did this year um, we did remind everyone about the um, continued conversation um, around fiber optics and broadband we uh, talked we reminded everyone that um, the that noon high school and mr. Hoffman specifically hosted a countywide forum um, and that almost every municipality over 118 about 118 people were present we talked about high-speed internet delivery a little bit being a priority for all county residents um, and talked about the fact that we've already partnered with Planet Networks um, to, to switch over our broadband here at Town Hall and in PD. We talked about the um, park analysis that's going on downtown right now um, with the balancing the needs with the um, new developments, uh, the high-end apartments, some of the developments that are being proposed, looking at a parking study because uh, it looks like we're, we're having an increased demand over the last couple years for parking needs um, in around the downtown area. We talked about the expanded social media and marketing efforts, um, business highlight videos, um, the work that we're doing over the next couple weeks with Newton High School and Sussex County Community College in, turn, in terms of working with volunteer social media influencers on the social media platforms that we're currently using. We updated folks on the redevelopment plan for high-end housing at 56 Patterson, the new cafe that uh, looks like it's going to be going on in Spring Street. We uh, also are proud to talk about the armory cleanup being completed in the next 12 to 18 months with then that property transitioning back to the town for um, new development to go in there. The uh, recent sale of the barrel house to a new developer, developer a developer talking about um, the Diller Avenue project as well, all coming forth with proposed um, plans for that property. Um, there were actually two of the presenters, USDA, the state of New Jersey, and um, the uh, Bureau of Municipalities or something, um, both highlighted the RPM building in their presentations, uh, talking about county county in general. So we were happy to report that the RPM building on the apartment front has been fully occupied almost since the second month that it was opened. We updated the county about the GNH redevelopment plan that is in process, that is going to, uh, that's the property um, uh, across from, uh, Shop right. That's going to at least the proposal now is including housing and three national fast casual food re retailers. Um, the Hicks Avenue redevelopment plan, um, the continued work on the Sussex County Community College and McGuire's redevelopment plan that's going to, in its current form, look like it's going to include housing, retail, commercial, and a parking deck. The um, $400,000 uh, community development blocks grant that we applied for and anticipate receiving, uh, which is a new grant application um, that the town has not realized in I don't even think we've uh, submitted an application in well over a decade um, Thor labs was of course on everybody's minds so we talked about the uh, weekly action team calls that we have with Thor labs uh, the work on their continued expansion to include the new the new buildings at Sparta Avenue which is going to be 150,000 a square feet of new building um, plus the transfer and improvements that they're doing at the former camp I lift building the Moose Lodge property and the several hundreds of new jobs that that project is going to add to the town of Newton. That's critically important to the county because everyone in the county recognizes that those jobs mean more housing, more business, and um, impacts all, all of the county, not just Newton. And then we talked about uh, the update um, and the, uh, the presentation that we're going to have tonight regarding the 10-year water and sewer capital budget plan to improve the existing infrastructure. Um, for the delivery of our water and sewer projects in town um, to support what's here already but also future developments so it was a pretty comprehensive list uh, that we were able to present to uh, the rest of the county of which I know Sandy and I received lots of comments um, after about so just wanted to update everyone on the discussion points uh, countywide earlier this week any other council manager comments or reports at this time 
All right, so we will move on then to our 10-year water sewer capital budget plan. So we'll ask our professionals and our team to come forward. Um, Start with uh, Fred, water and sewer. Okay. So if you could reintroduce yourself uh, for the benefit of the public, that would be great. Why don't you pass your reports out? Um, And Fred, before you get started, one other thing, because uh, this is a, a proclamation that will have a record, but we'll have a new Eagle Scout uh, living in the town of Newton as of Saturday, so I know many of us are going to be going to that um, presentation as well. So congratulations publicly to Brendan Reed on his accomplishments. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Fred Margron. I've had the pleasure of serving as the the, uh, the municipal sewer engineer for Newton for the last uh, almost last year at this point uh, at the request of the town manager uh, we prepared a 10-year capital plan for the wastewater system uh, this was put together uh, looking at uh, a series of documents that you had that were existing prior uh, inspection reports uh, capital plans that had been prepared in the plat in the past uh, and a uh, a series of meetings with the DPW staff who were uh, really instrumental in helping put this together and to help prioritize the project as well. You can see the, the report describes in, in greater detail what I'm going to touch on in, in bullet form and certainly we can go into any greater detail that you like uh, as we go through things. Uh, but the plan outlines some 15 projects that need to be done over the next 10 years. Uh, first one is the Sparta Avenue pump station. Uh, the Sparta Avenue pump station was originally constructed in 1954. Uh, it's probably one of the most critical pieces of infrastructure, wastewater infrastructure for the town, uh, with more than half of the town's wastewater flowing through it. Now, the town has authorized the uh, design for the pump station, and at this point, the design is well underway. Uh, in fact, I'm meeting with the uh, DPW staff on Thursday to do a review of the preliminary plans, and the whole is to have uh, everything out to DP and be in position to bid the project by the spring of 2020. Uh, the estimated construction cost for that project is $2.82 million. Mm -hmm. The next project on the list is the digester conversion. Uh, the existing uh, anaerobic digesters at the plant were originally constructed back in 1953 and went through renovation in 1990. So again, you can see you're talking about facilities that without the renovation, the original facilities are in excess of 60 years old. Uh, the facility is currently in disrepair, uh, is not really operational, uh, and it's a uh, treatment system that is really beneficial to the town for two reasons. One in that it helps uh, reduce the pathogens in the sludge. The other is that it destroys the, uh, the vol volatile organics and uh, reduces the volume of the sludge that you have to pay to dispose of. Uh, usually the reduction is something on the order of about 25% with a properly functioning digester. Now the existing system, as I mentioned, is anaerobic. Uh, what we're proposing is to convert that to what they call an aerobic system. Uh, the difference between the two is that anaerobic is without oxygen, where aerobic is with oxygen. Uh, the benefit of the aerobic is that you, you have a much simpler system to operate. Uh, it's not as temperature dependent as the anaerobic uh, system is, and you also have the benefit of not having uh, the potential for odor problems that you do with the, uh, the anaerobic uh, digester. And currently we have an anaerobic that's not functioning that's correct. at all? That's correct. Uh, we're recommending that the design for this be approved in uh, late 2019, early 2020, uh, with the uh, start of construction planned for late 2020. The projected construction cost for this project is $850,000. And there are two other uh, related projects that we're recommending be done at the same time uh, so that you can get really an economy of scale. They're all work at the plant and, uh, and somewhat related to this as well. 
The first of those additional projects is the uh, primary sludge pump replacement. Uh, this basically takes the sludge from the primary tanks and gives the operator the ability to uh, move it around as he needs for his operation and uh, most importantly to be able to send it to the digester so that you can go through the treatment process to do the volatile reduction that we talked about previously. Uh, this is another part of the plant that dates back to 1953, uh, went through the same 1990 renovation. Uh, we're recommending that the design be approved, as I said, late 2019, early 2020, with the idea of undertaking the construction in late 2020. Uh, the projected cost for this construction project is $250,000. Pardon me. Uh, the next project on the list is the uh, replacement of the first stage pumps. Uh, the first stage pump station was constructed in 1990. What that uh, facility does is convey the uh, wastewater flow from the primary <coughs> settling tanks over to the trickling filters, if you're, you're familiar with the plant. Those are the big, tall, cylindrical tanks. Um, again, they are in excess of 30 years old at this point uh, and in need of uh, rehabilitation and replacement. Was the trickling filter before the RVCs? Yes. Yes, it is. It is a, uh, you have a basically a two-stage biological system. The trickling filter uh, really helps uh, to take any of the, uh, the strong loads that may come into the plant out and uh, equalize the, uh, the biological load that goes into the RVCs, making it a much uh, easier process to control. Okay. Now, we're uh, recommending that this, as I said, be done in conjunction with the other two projects at the plant. So we're looking for late 2019, early 2024 design, start of construction for late 2020, and the projected cost for the pump replacement is $29,500. <coughs> Next project on the list is the Sussex Street Pump Station pump replacement. Uh, the existing pumps date back to the late 1960s. Uh, they are essentially at the end of their useful life. Uh, they are a, uh, a pneumatically operated system. They're not the normal electrically driven pumps, so uh, they're much more uh, sensitive when it comes to making sure that you uh, keep them in good repair. Um, at this point, we're recommending an in-kind replacement because the uh, pump station is slated for consolidation with the Miriam Avenue pump station as one of the later projects I'll discuss in 2028. So this is basically to keep the pump station in good repair until you're ready for that consolidation project. Uh, this is recommended for design to be approved in uh, late 2019, early 2020, start of construction planned for late 2020. Uh, the projected cost for this work is $81,500. Next project on the list is the final, final settling tank drive replacement. Uh, the final settling tank is one of the last of the treatment units that's in the, uh, the wastewater treatment plant right after the RBCs. Uh, the facility was inspected in 2013 overall found to be in good condition. However, there are a couple of components that do require replacement after 30 years of operation. Uh, we're recommending that the design for this be approved for 2020 with the start of construction planned for early 2021. And the projected construction cost for this is estimated at $360,000. Next project on the list is the first phase of the sewer repairs. Uh, this is a portion of the high priority work that was outlined in that 2018 sewer inspection report that was done for the town. Uh, the specifics are outlined in the report. Uh, however, we're recommending that the design for this be scheduled for 2021 with the construction planned for early 2022. The projected co construction cost for this work is estimated at approximately $402,000. Next project on the list is the pump station improvement program study. Uh, the town owns and operates five wastewater pump stations in its system. Um, essentially, these, they vary in age and in design depending on how they came into the, the possession of the town. Uh, because of the, uh, the nature of uh, wastewater, it's a very uh, 
uh, abusive or harsh environment for equipment. Uh, it's our recommendation that a, uh, an evaluation be conducted of the pump stations. The purpose of this would be to determine what, what components are in need of replacement, what components are in need of uh, rehabilitation. Uh, this is to be done so that you don't uh, end up having to deal with this as a, uh, when a, a piece of equipment fails, you can do it in a proactive manner, uh, which is always a much less expensive way to tackle a problem than when you're in a dire state of emergency. We're recommending that this study be done for 2021, and the projected cost for this work is estimated at $30,000. The next project on the list is the wastewater treatment plant power study. Uh, pretty much the, the same kind of philosophy that we were talking about for the pump stations, we're talking about applying to the uh, electrical power distribution system within the wastewater treatment plant. Um, as I mentioned before, the original plant dates back to 1953, and it went through a renovation in 1990. So components in that facility range from 65 to 30 years of age or more. Now, what the, uh, the, the power study will do is go through and evaluate all the electrical components of the plant. Uh, as I mentioned, a wastewater treatment plant environment is very harsh. Uh, it is a wet environment, it is a corrosive environment, and it's very hard on electrical systems in particular. Uh, so the idea is to identify potential problems before they, they happen or before failure occurs. This would allow us to identify uh, components that are in need of repair or replacement prior to a failure occurring. We're recommending that the study be approved for 2021 and the estimated cost for that is approximately $70,000. The next project on the list is the second phase of the sewer repairs. This would be the second batch of the high priority work that was out uh, outlined in the 2018 sewer inspection report. Uh, we're recommending that design be approved in 2022 with the start of construction planned for 2023. The projected construction cost for this work is estimated at approximately $455,000. The next project is the third phase of sewer repairs outlined in that same study. This is the low priority work that was identified in that document. Uh, we are recommending that this be approved for 2023 design with construction plans for 2024. The projected construction cost is estimated at approximately $603,000. The next project is the chemical facility upgrade at the wastewater treatment plant. There are a number of chemicals that are used at the wastewater plant in order to uh, allow it to stay in compliance with the discharge permit that is issued by New Jersey DEP. Uh, uh, we're recommending that uh, these facilities be upgraded. Uh, again, the equipment is old. Uh, chemicals and the environment itself are very harsh on the equipment, so it's, it's in need of uh, attention at this point. Uh, we're recommending that the design be approved for 2024 with the start of construction planned for early 2025. The projected construction cost is estimated at approximately $298,000. Next project on the list is the UV disinfection facility. Uh, the, the town currently employs uh, chemical chlorination and dechlorination as the final method of disinfection uh, at the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, the system uses gaseous chlorine and sulfur dioxide, which are hazardous chemicals. Uh, the advantage of going to UV disinfection is that you eliminate that potential hazard associated with those chemicals. And in addition to that, uh, you're all familiar with the fact that the state's been cracking down on disinfection byproducts on the, on the drinking water end. The trend is also following on the wastewater end as well. So it's expected that at one point uh, the limits will become more stringent for the wastewater treatment plant. Now, at this point, we're recommending uh, that design be scheduled for 2025 with the idea of construction in 2026. Uh, the construction cost is estimated at approximately $1.06 million. However, because this is something that is really dependent on uh, the DEP limits that would be issued, uh, we're recommending that this would be something that would be adjusted depending on the schedule for those new limits that would come in. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's basically a placeholder at this mm -hmm. point. Uh, do we know what the do, do we know what the state's horizon is on enforcement and 
My guess is that you'll probably see a monitoring requirement in your next permit cycle with the requirement to do implementation with the, the following second. renewal. Okay. That's their, their normal mode of operation. Uh, the next project is the force main condition assessment. Um, along with those five pump stations that I discussed before, uh, there is some 6,000 linear feet of pressurized force main that takes the wastewater from those pump stations to various points in the system, along with uh, air release valves, control valves, isolation valves, and all of that. Um, as you did with the uh, gravity sewer system, we're recommending that an assessment be done to determine the condition of the lines and valves, what have you. Again, the idea is to be proactive identify problems before they occur, and uh, identify what would need to be replaced or repaired before the problem happens. Um, this is something we're recommending be scheduled for 2026, and the cost is estimated at approximately $79,000. The last project is the consolidation of the Sussex Street and Merriam Avenue pump stations, as I mentioned before. Uh, the, the Sussex Street pump station, uh, as I mentioned, was a late 1960s facility. Um, the idea is to eliminate the whole pneumatic uh, pump station, convey the flow from that location over to the Miriam Avenue pump station, which is a larger facility, uh, and upgrade that facility to a, uh, a more modern, upgraded, uh, standard sewage pumping station. Um, the the uh, project is scheduled for design for 2027 with construction planned for 2028, and the projected cost for this is $1.28 million. Now, in addition to the, the projects that I've discussed, I was asked by the town manager to reach out to USDA to find out what potential financing options were out there. Uh, they indicated really that uh, for their pro program to be cost effective, the town should look at either individual projects or bundling projects so that you have an overall budget of about a million dollars. That seems to be their, their sweet their, point in their, their, sweet point to mm -hmm. be their cost effect. They talked about that the other night. Um, the other thing that they mentioned is that depending on the, uh, the needs of the town, we could look to bundle water and wastewater projects to get to that million dollar number, uh, which is something that could be very helpful for us as well. And uh, lastly, one of the things we talked about was the grant program that USDA has. Uh, based on uh, Newton's demographics and history, they're projecting, based on the current uh, situation that's there, uh, that we would probably qualify for something on the order of 25% grant uh, for funding of the projects. Their normal um, uh, finance period is 40 years instead of the usual 20. Mm -hmm. uh, that's good and bad too. Obviously, you pay more interest, but the uh, the debt service is some somewhat lower. Mm -hmm. uh, but the the advantage would be the you know the grant component certainly uh, in looking at doing the funding through them. Uh, the other alternative that you would have, of course, is the New Jersey Infrastructure Bank. Um, generally, they are at uh, half of the project being funded at market rate, the other half being funded at uh, zero percent, which gives you about a half market rate net interest rate. Uh, their funding is either 20 or 30 years, depending on what the town would be interested in pursuing. Okay. And that, in a nutshell, is the uh, the capital plan. If I can provide any additional information. Yeah, so um, the USDA was present the other night, and they talked about uh, some of the grant programs. They just talked about that they, their sweet spot for financing is about that million-dollar um, level, um, but that they were very interested in talking, and they were talking specifically about some of these projects. They were talking about infrastructure, sewer mm. line improvements, water um, at the Sussex County Economic Development Partnership uh, meeting. The USDA was there presenting, um, and they talked about the grant money that's available. Um, the issue, as I'm doing some of this math, is that you know with their 40-year financing, I mean, obviously we want to take advantage of the grant money, but some of those longer projects look longer-term projects would probably look better because with 40-year financing, I mean, we're talking about you know some of these facilities being built in the 50s and then in the 90s being rehabilitated or updated about 40 years now we're looking about that 30 year cycle again and then mm -hmm. you know if you're financing out over 40 years you're just paying off the debt when yeah. you need to yeah. do the improvements again you're kind of back at it um, but you know obviously we want to look at all the grant opportunities and look at you know what there are what what's available the New Jersey Infrastructure Bank um, financing option is interesting um, the half 
half of the project being funded at the market rate and half being funded at zero percent, do they have a, a dollar amount threshold? They do not, but uh, in general they are very uh, labor and paperwork intensive. Yeah. Um, rule of thumb for them is also that same million dollar and up number. And I understand that on the horizon, then there might be changes to the New Jersey Infrastructure Bank because of political things happening down in Trenton, right? Aren't they looking um, to make some changes? They, they, they actually have made a lot of changes, even in the last probably two years. Uh -huh. uh, they've gone from a, a standard schedule for financing that you had to adhere to. Uh, now it's a, a rolling program, so it's much easier to deal with. Uh, the folks down there have simplified the application process dramatically. Um, what used to be probably one of the most tedious uh, operations that we used to have to deal with uh, in terms of, of uh, arranging for financing is now probably one of the most straightforward. Everything is online. Everything is very, very uh, straightforward. They've really done a good job of uh, streamlining their program. Uh, in addition to that, uh, one of the big challenges I think that you're going to face is that the need for uh, funding through the New Jersey Infrastructure Bank is going to be dominated by the large cities in the coming years because of the combined sewer overflow problem. Mm -hmm. um, the schedule that they are on right now is that their uh, long-term control plan or master plans are due next year, which means cons design and construction and their projects will probably start happening uh, within a year or two after that. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about, you know, all the big cities in New Jersey, you know, Newark, Patterson, Jersey City, Elizabeth. Uh, the, the need for financing for the combined sewer far outstrips the, uh, the amount of funding available through the New Jersey Infrastructure Bank. So, so they're going to run out of money on the bigger cities' projects. Who knows what's going to happen unless they get more money from, from D.C. Or, mm -hmm. or where have you. Mm -hmm. The other thing I noticed is that in your um, project description, uh, list the prices because we are talking about a 10 year plan. Um, some of the estimated costs are um, adjusted based on the construction year, so that's carrying for inflation, um, increase in well, everything that's presented and is in 2019 dollars. So if you're looking at a 2028 project, it would have to be adjusted for so 2019 dollars, yes, everything in adjusted to construction dollars. year. Okay, so I read that the other way. So this is the estimated cost. It says adjusted to construction year, but it's the 2019, 2019 cost. Okay. So part of the reason that we asked for this um, assessment to be done when you came on was because we had that 2018 kind of project list that was done, um, and we knew that we needed to be looking at long-term capital because of the age. We knew that, again, some of those facilities were – built in the 50s, improved upon in the 90s, and here we are going in a couple months away from the 2020s, right? Um, you know, it's, in my opinion, part of the reason why we chose Newton was because we had a water and sewer system and as a private resident didn't have to worry about our own septic and um, those kinds of issues. But, you know, fortunately, um, this is a kind of self-liquidating utility in that um, in a smart way or in a in a – thoughtful and uh, kind business way, this is set up different than our regular um, uh, capital improvement budget. These are projects that would be, you know, financed under the Water and Sewer Authority, um, you know, and through um, the service being provided. So we'll talk a lot about this during the budgeting process for sure, um, but this is, again, just to remind everybody that these are projects that um, are going to impact the water and sewer utility as opposed to the municipal um, capital plan or budget things that we, you know, typically discuss on a year-in, year-in year basis. Um, some other questions for Fred? I think some of these we definitely knew about, right? And then some of them are new. Um, recommendations based on being out in the field and looking at some of the. So, and as I said, meeting with the, the DPW staff, they've been uh, very supportive in, in helping put the document together. We have a couple of team members here tonight. Any additional comments um, or anything that you want us to know from the field work about anything in PCI's report? I'm not, I'm not 
not really. It's definitely. Do you just introduce yourself for? Okay, I'm Ken Jekyll. Um, I oversee the water and sewer uh, at this moment. Um, any of you have taken a walk down there, you see there's things that have to be done. Um, some of it naturally you, you you can take care of yourself, but like Fred said, as the stuff ages, it, it just takes care of time. It's, a lot of it, its time is, is definitely due. It, it's actually some of it probably long overdue. That Sparta pump station. Um, it's long overdue. Yeah, that one. Yeah, it's not a good one, but. Which is probably why it's number one on the list. But. Yeah, and I would like to see us, if we could, actually follow Fred's suggestions because I'm not a believer in trying to put things off because then we're left, um, especially the guys, trying to keep that stuff running. And you know then you're spending more money to keep running, to hold it, and as you said and Fred just said, construction costs are only going to go up. They're not going to go down. So the longer you wait on some of these things, the cost naturally is going to go up at the same time. Well, good. So. I think we're on the same page then. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that we've seen is some of it's um, outlived its useful life. I mean, a lot of times when you replace equipment or build things, you know whether you're putting a roof on your house, it's going to last about 20 years, depending on the materials, or et cetera, et cetera. And some of, the, some of these projects and the, this infrastructure, it's still working because of the competence of the staff and of the team that you have. Um, whether it's fixing water main breaks or doing regular maintenance or whatever the case may be, you really have expanded the life on a lot of these structures. And that, that goes, like you said, with the quality of the guys. And anything we can do ourselves to save the town money, that's what these guys have been doing. Fred was talking about the uh, chemical uh, tank and pump upgrades. Actually, the guys the last three years have spent time rebuilding those pumps themselves to keep them going. Once we got a new pump and saw how much it cost to get that new pump, we went out and tried to find the parts for the existing pumps just to keep those going. And we actually have parts on hand to keep those going as long as we can. So. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to ask a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I think moving forward, if we could get a map of a, a diagram of the water, of the um, sewer treatment plan, I think for the edification of, of all of us here, of inlet, settling tank, floor sure. bays, like almost like blowing up like that. Doesn't have to be an like engineering a drawing, a schematic, mm -hmm. if you okay. would. Water goes in here, goes to clarifier, goes to RBC, trickling filter, it would just help, um, it would help the flow. Every time so, I'm down there, I need a reminder of which like part and tank is which, yeah. So the RBCs, I've heard that they are, well, I know that the technology is no longer utilized in, in the world of, of wastewater treatment plants, correct? And no, that's not true. Uh, RBCs are, um, are well used. They're still around. They're still manufactured. Still manufactured? Yeah. Okay. Um, and they are one of the simplest, most reliable systems, just like the trickling filter that you have. Okay. Uh, so you encourage to invest oh. in the rehabilitation of the RBCs? Uh, at this point, uh, the RBCs have already been rehabilitated. There's no need to do additional investment in them at this point. I thought we had only done a few, but there were... The, the ones that, that needed it were The ones done. that needed it. Yeah, but the uh, like I said, the parts are still available, and it's it's such a simple system. Uh, you know the old saying: if it's not broke, don't fix okay. it. Um, it really is. If you make the conversion to go to to uh, activated sludge or one of the more uh, common operational processes right now, um, your cost for electricity will go up. Your cost for operations will go up. It requires more attention from the operator. Uh, to keep everything just right, uh, and just look at the performance of the plant. You're you're discharging in single digits on almost all your parameters, so uh, it's running very very well. And we're not spiking. No. Okay. Um, how's the I and I? Is that do we still have issues on that? Or yes, you do. That that's related to the to the sewer system itself, uh, which is old, and that's you know as we undertake some of these sewer rehabilitation projects uh, some of that will go down but you are within the uh, acceptable EPA norms for INI so they, they basically say if you're outside the norms it's worth investing money to do the 
INI reduction. If you're within the standards, uh, basically they just say you're better off doing the treatment. So as far as the phase one, two, and three of the sewer line repairs, have you, have you guys dissected Hatchmot and Red Zone Robotics um, <coughs> report, and that's where mm -hmm. you came up with this? That's correct. Okay. Um, and obviously there's other there's things that break along the way. and that, that, that You can have an emergency yeah. happen any day, um, and that would just yeah. you know, have to be addressed by the staff, and they've, they've been doing that all along. Now, are you talking about lining? Is that one of the... There's a combination of things that would be done. Uh, the, uh, the rehabilitation work is a mixture of uh, pipe replacement. Uh, Hatchmont recommended spot lining in a lot of areas. I'm not a really big fan of spot lining. My preference is to do at least the reach between manholes. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, if one little spot is bad, the whole reach is bad. Uh, but that's something we can certainly look at once we're in the design phase. Um, the cost differential usually is not that much by the time that you're done. Um, and then there's a lot of manhole uh, rehabilitation work that's included in that as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that your firm is, is staffed and suited to take these projects from design to construction in, in the time schedule which you laid out? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, that's, that's what we I do. I just had to ask. That's fine. <laughs> that's fine. For the record. <laughs> just I mean, we've undertaken uh, two projects, or at least two, two capital projects so far this year since we've taken. The grid chamber is actually, the pre-construction meeting is the 30th. Uh, Thursday, yep. and the uh, the pump station we're meeting to do the review on the plans this Thursday as well. So, and the only authority for the review is at the DEP and that standalone, or is there? Uh, you'll have to um, go through DEP to get your treatment works approval, and then local building permits will also be required. What else? Um, we were enough? thinking. No. He you can have us ask as many questions as you want. Um, understanding that part of the reason that we asked for the 10-year horizon was obviously to understand the impacts, cost impacts, and then to stretch out the impact of those cost impacts mm -hmm. over 10 years. But I, but I agree with you that some of the timeline uh, might change based on the EPA, the state, the DEP, um, and what changes might come down. And I know Mr. Simmons is going to talk to us about the water projects. Um, you're focusing on sewer, but I'm sure that he would agree that there's, I mean, we are already running up against some of the state mandated um, restrictions, for lack of a better word, or changes or implementations that they want to see over the next couple of years. So um, you had talked about bundling for the purposes, perhaps, of some financing through USDA. So. Um, the way that you've laid this out, would you change some of the timing if we were to try to group some of them? Uh, certainly, we, we would work with the town uh, to um, help bundle the, the water and wastewater projects within you know what, what's affordable for you. So uh, this was predicated upon um, need more than money. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, if we have the additional information on, you know, uh, an annual budget that would be made available for for capital projects or you know an allotment for debt service on an annual basis, we could work out, you know, how much could be made to work. Okay. Other questions for Mr. Marburn at this time? Councilman Diglio? No, I was actually starting to look ahead to water to see what could be bundled. <laughs> Councilman Schlafer? Never. Um, so I'm going to ask, uh, obviously you're going to stay to hear uh, Mr. Simmons as well, but I'm going to ask you to also kind of stick around um, for the second public portion just in case there are some questions um, from the public, if that's okay. Sure. Mr. Jekyll, anything else to add to the sewer part of the conversation? No. Mr. Carr? Very good, very no? Okay. Dan, you're good, no other questions? Okay. All right. Mr. Simmons, you're up. Okay. You can join the seat next or
Mr. Simmons, if you could also reintroduce yourself when you get back to the microphone, just for the public's knowledge. Yes, good evening, everyone. I'm Dave Simmons from Harold Pellow and Associates, and I serve as the town's water engineer for different projects from time to time, as well as the planning board and uh, of the town of Newton for several years. Overall historian. I like that title very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, basically, similar to what uh, Fred just talked about, we were looking at a 10-year plan uh, for the water system components. And one of the things we tried to do when we had a meeting with uh, Mr. Jekyll and Mr. Carr and the town manager was trying to come up with projects that we knew were a, more of an immediate need, if you will, and try and prioritize them. One of the things that the state has required all public water systems at a certain sizes to do is come up with what they call an asset management plan. Mm -hmm. And basically they want you to look at your infrastructure and be more proactive, if you will, as Fred just mentioned, as opposed to reactive. Things can happen three seconds from now and you have to deal with it and that's the way the real world works. But by the same token, as we've analyzed the different components of the system, we looked at what do we really need in order to keep things functioning. Uh, because the other thing that's going on in the water and sewer parts to to capitalize on is from time to time you'll have development come in, for example, the Thor Labs. And as Fred mentioned, one of his projects is to uh, inspect the force main. And for example, things can change when Thor Labs came in. They've got to relocate about 1,500 feet or so, or 1,000 feet, whatever it is, of the force main. Mm -hmm. So there'll be an opportunity as part of the development to get some new main put in mm -hmm. and also to check out the condition of the main in that area. Mm -hmm. So there's all sorts of things happening along the line that kind of impact this and push and pull it uh, right. from time frame and costs and everything else. But this is what we came up with at this point. And in time. we do work those conversations um, and those processes in the planning board level with those developers agreements. And you know, if there is work to be done, oftentimes um, that liability is is offset by the developers portion. Well, that's a good point. And for example, uh, the council mentioned about the study that was done on the sanitary sewer, the condition of some of the lines, and for the proposed building that Thor Labs is putting up basically on the corner of Lower Spring Street and Diller Avenue, where they're tying into the existing gravity line on uh, Diller, uh, excuse me, Lower Spring Street. Mm -hmm. That was one of the areas when uh, Kenny and Joe and I had a meeting that was identified as an area of need of rehabilitation. So I believe in the developer's agreement we put that in there that they just can't tie into that because it's could be problematic. They have to so improve it. Put that improvement in. Yeah. So there's a case where they're taking care of that type of thing. Right. And Thor, and that, and, uh, plain English, Thor Labs is paying for that. That's um, the bottom that, line. That's right. And the and the improved, the realized improvement on that benefits the entire town, but it's a part of their agreement. That's right. Yep. That's right. And by the same token, they're going to be constructing a new water main from Sparta Avenue all the way to Lower Spring Street because mm -hmm. they need the water for their fire protection and also for uh, their domestic use for their building. But one side benefit of that is it's going to provide another sub-loop, if you will, to bring some more water to Lower Spring Street and that area of town as well. Mm -hmm. So it reinforces the distribution system. And really those neg negotiations happen, I mean, they're discussed at the planning board level, but the developers' agreements are with Redevelopment Council, Mr. Russo, and our staff um, in town. They're really the ones that are looking out for that piece in terms of a cost savings for the town, but also looking forward to the improvements that can be made as a result of the new development going in. Because it's, you know, really those improvements are going to support the development, but it can't be developed at the cost or the impact to the rest of the community. Correct. Always looking out for the good folks of the town of Newton. Right. Okay. Go ahead, David. Okay. So just looking at the plan, we basically came up with a series of projects that we thought were appropriate and associated costs. Uh, for the year 2020, we talked about the Lower Glen Lake blow-off and hydrant and valve replacement and repair. Those are basically two separate projects. Uh, if you'll recall, several years ago, uh, Lake Burnbray, Lower Glen Lake over in Sparta, just below Morris Lake Reservoir, they were in the process of reconstructing their dam. And one of the things that came up at that time was Newton had a 12-inch main that was the original main from the 1890s that went from the gatehouse at Morris Lake along the bottom of Lower Glen Lake through their dam and then down through the Glen. Uh, at that time, 
that was the original main, but that could no longer be used by Newton because it didn't carry treated water. When the filtration plant was built in the early 2000s, the water goes through the 16-inch main, through a pump station vault, all the way up to the filtration plant, through clear wells, and then by gravity down Morris Lake Road. So what we worked out with the developer, excuse me, with the owner of Lower Glen Lake was uh, a release of Newton's easement rights to that main because it was no longer needed, and in turn we were allowed to sever about a 15-foot section to basically eliminate any costs associated with that dam or that particular main. Now, the reason we cut that out is where the blow-off comes into play. When the 16-inch main was put in the gatehouse, that eliminated the blow-off out of the gatehouse and out of Morris Lake Dam to lower the lake manually. Using this 12-inch main, we can reinstall and replace that low-level outlet by virtue of the fact that we could drain it into Lower Glen Lake. That was done in a two-step process. The first process was to find it and sever it so that we were grouted and away from Glen Lake. The second part is basically now that we know how deep that is after literally over 100 years of sediment and silt, to build the necessary offset piece and install that and the valve in the gatehouse so that, God forbid, but in the event of a hurricane or some reason that you had to artificially lower Morris Lake, you could do that from the safety of the dam up in the gatehouse. So that's what that part is. It's the second part that the DEP and the Bureau of Water System Engineering are allowing us to do. Uh, the second thing is hydrant valve replacement and repair. A little bit ago I mentioned... Mr. Simmons, just for the public, can you just also, as uh, Mr. Margaret did, just talk about the proposed construction year and the cost? Absolutely. Thank you. For the uh, blow-off for Phase 2, based on talking to the diving contractors and what they estimate based on being out there before, that's about $75,000. And a 2020 project. Correct. Mm -hmm. For the uh, hydrant and valve replacement and repairs, I mentioned a few minutes ago that we were talking about the asset management plan that the town has to participate in and most other water systems of certain size. Uh, basically, the water staff is ongoing with that process. They've literally got to inspect every valve, operate certain percentages of the valves, just to make sure everything is operational. It's a good thing from the standpoint if you don't, as the saying goes, use it or lose it. Mm -hmm. Either operate the valve and make sure it's operating properly, or if there's a problem, get it repaired or replaced, because you don't want to find out about it when you really need it. It's too late. So based on our discussions with how far the water department has gotten as far as inspecting and analyzing all the different valves and hybrids at this point, that's where we came up with a figure, at least for the first uh, six valves and six fire hydrants, of about $126,000. Now, the reason we put that higher figure in there, you don't know necessarily where all those valves are located. By that I mean it may not necessarily be on a dead-end street like the end of Union Place. It could be in Route 206, Route 94, where there's traffic control, concrete roads that you've got to jackhammer and cut through. Extensive work to replace a valve. It sounds like a basic thing, but there's logistics involved and what have you, so we tried to hedge the, our bet as far as, okay, let's be always optimistic, but look at the pessimistic side as far as the cost where the valves might need to be repaired. Mm -hmm. So that's where that cost came in. 2021, tw total try how the methane and how the city acid study and mitigation. Uh, Fred's been mainly taking the lead on this, but as you know, they've had a concern with the uh, rise in the byproducts from disinfection, as he just mentioned a few minutes ago. And I know from our meeting that Kenny and Joe and I have every Thursday afternoon at our office to go over water projects. They're talking about a pilot project to address some of this, mainly at the source versus in town at the tank and what have you because of the age of the water. And it's a little bit of an unknown right now, but we put a figure of $100,000 in there for testing to find a permanent solution to that whole situation because it is an ongoing thing that has to be addressed, I think, sooner than later. Uh, one of the ways that they've addressed it in the short run is to flush some of the mains uh, so that you get the quote-unquote newer water versus mm -hmm. older water that can develop more trihalomethanes or halicidic acids. The other side of that coin is Joe does keep track of that water, 
but the reality of it is it's water used for flushing just to keep the water quality up, mm -hmm. but by the same token, it takes away from your water allocation. Mm -hmm. So that's water that you might want to use someday for another project, some developer coming into town, and you don't want to necessarily for the long term be using that water to run the water just to waste it so you get new water and meet the test requirements. Yeah, so again, another double-edged sword, right, because the levels um, are mandated, watched, regulated by the state, right. um, and we have to report on those often, and we're close uh, yes. oftentimes, which is why we have to do the um, runoff, but then we're also in constant conversation with the state with regards to our water allocation levels. Correct. Um, so, you know, there's both sides of the equation that I know that you guys are actively managing as well. Correct. Okay. So that's why we put some funds in there. For 2022 Sparta Glen, the Montana Crossing improvements. What the Montana Crossing is, uh, back in August of 2000, we had the flood in Sparta Glen. And when that flood came, basically it wiped out about a mile of Newton's transmission mains, the 10 inch and the 16 inch main in Sparta Glen, basically from Morris Lake Road all the way down to Glen Road. When that when those two mains were put into Sparta Glen, the 10-inch main in the 1890s and the 16-inch main in the early 70s, uh, basically the 16-inch main in particular was routed through the Glen to avoid the most impact to the existing trees and the parks-like setting down in that area. And at that time, uh, I believe if I remember correctly, there were seven stream crossings through the across the coming down through the Glen from the discharge of Glen Lake and Morris Lake. When that whole thing was destroyed in August of 2000, we had to relocate the new 20-inch main, and we kept it out of harm's way as much as we could given the location down in the Glen, but we reduced the number of stream crossings from seven to three. So there was a substantial improvement at that time as far as the vulnerability to stream crossings. Having said that, there's the main, if you can imagine for those of you, and I know you all have gone up through the Glen, when you go in off of Glen Road, there's a big arch pipe, that's the first stream crossing. Then as you go past the pavilion and the gravel driveway, as far as you can go on a gravel driveway, that's the Montana crossing, that's the second crossing. When we were out there working, it just looked like the Marlboro Man was gonna come across on a horse, so we <laughs> called it the Montana crossing, that's how it got its name. And it's stuck. <laughs> but be that as it may, uh, what happened over the years, that was originally put in deep and was concrete encased just like the other two crossings. Over the years since the August 2000 flood, we've had two or three hurricanes that have come mm -hmm. through. And in that particular area, it's like the water was constantly wearing through that material in Sparta Glen. And it wore to the point where on the Montana crossing, you can actually see the concrete encasement on top of the main. That's what we're talking about here. Okay. So the concrete encasement has done a good job between encasing the main and also, if you recall, that 20-inch pipe had a special snap lock joint to it, not just the traditional, what they call a tie-down joint, where you push it together. It actually has a uh, casting in the bell end of the <coughs> pipe to hold it together as a structural joint as well. So that's worked well for the town. <coughs> But we wanted to investigate that to, in fact, see if we could deepen that or encase it with more concrete to make it more sturdy for reliability of the transmission main. To those ends, uh, we contacted Sparta Township, and as a matter of fact, the Water Department is working on it this week or next to go out and dig some preliminary test holes in the bank, not in the brook, but in the bank, because they're allowed to do that under the wetland rules and see what the depth is to bedrock. Because before we came up with a plan to lower that, we'd want to see, are we down at rock right now? Would we have to actually uh, work on hammering out rock if we were to lower it, et cetera, et cetera. So this year is some preliminary work as far as determining what the conditions are there right now, and also what would be involved for a feasible plan for a contractor to bid on to lower that main in that section. That's the Montana section. Uh, and that figure, we had come up with about $115,000. For 2023, pump system and controls in the Morris Lake Gatehouse. 
This is an interesting project from the standpoint that, remember a few minutes ago I mentioned that in the gatehouse, when they put the 16-inch main in in the 1970s, they took away that low-level blow-off out of the gatehouse. Mm -hmm. Well, when that 12-inch main along Lower Glen Lake was in place, water would flow out of the gatehouse by gravity all the way to the bottom of the gatehouse. Okay? When the filtration plant was built in the early 2000s, that whole hydraulic system changed from the standpoint that water would flow by gravity to what's called the raw water pump fault, and from that raw water pump fault, the water has to be pumped up into the filtration plant building and through the filters and all the other treatment. And then after it's filtered and treated, it flows into the clear well, and then it flows from there by gravity to the town of Newton. The 16-inch main, and I think we talked about this when we had our drought period a couple years ago, the 16-inch main that goes from the gatehouse to the raw water pump vault is not a level pipe because when they originally built the 16-inch main in the early 2000s, excuse me, in the 1970s, they ran into rock right by the dam, and they were reluctant to blast by the masonry dam at that point to lower that 16-inch main. So the grade that you have is the grade that you have and what everything was built to. The reason that's significant is when we submitted the information to the DEP for an increase in our water allocation, they said, okay, Dave, you can only get down to a certain level by gravity. And remember, we talked mm -hmm. about that in the drought. We can only get down so far, and then we'd have to pump. Mm -hmm. So they said, do you want us to look at the water allocation that you want based on the gravity flow? And I said, no. What we can do, not that we necessarily want to use it all the time, but we could put a pump, pump in, in the bottom of the gatehouse mm -hmm. and capture some of that, that slice of water, if you will, that we used in the past before the filtration plant was built so you could get that additional allocation for the town of Newton. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple ways that that can be done depending on some of the configurations that we're looking at with the pumping system. And depending on, we were going to give the information to the DEP, Bureau of Water Allocation, the best possible outcome. And depending on which pump you choose, that may involve bringing some additional power out and some additional controls and what have you to operate that pump if, in fact, you should get the water level down to that point. So bottom line is that cost of $150,000 is that additional pumping equipment to help get the water out as much as you can for the for the use of the reservoir itself. I distinctly remember the diagrams that you showing of like where the water level were, where the water levels were, where the pump was, how it had to go uphill before it went downhill. That's right. Um, which is why the pumps were suggested. That's and right. And in those in those years, like measuring on a weekly basis, how much the water line was sitting below the normal levels. That's right. And what that meant in terms of water allocation and how much, how many more inches we had left before we reached the point when we had to start pumping. That's right. That's um, exactly right. Right. Am I remembering that right? I mean, we were like two and a half feet at some point below comfort level. Correct. You're exactly right because there gets to a point where uh, if you don't have enough water <coughs> positive head on the pumps, mm -hmm. they'll start to cavitate and then you're in an issue. It was to the point where we didn't get to that point, thank, thank the Lord, but if you had had to put a pump in the gatehouse, mm -hmm. the well of the gatehouse, could have pumped from there into the raw water pump vault and basically do the same thing that I'm talking about here yeah. to have available to you on a permanent basis. And that's when we were putting the water restrictions in place. Um, off and on. Until 2017. Yeah. Okay. So that's that one. Uh, next year, 2024, uh, dam sites number two and number three, low level outlet pipes and locating, clearing the screens and the operating valves. We included this in because the dams that we're talking about aren't necessarily the supplies of water like Morris Lake, but by the same token, the DEP, we've done dam inspections for many years, and if you had a problem with any of the dam and it failed, not that it's going to fail, I'm not mm -hmm, saying that, mm -hmm. but if it had, did fail and wash out the distribution lines below it and what have you, it has an indirect effect on the distribution system and the water system as well. So over the years, the town has done a lot of work on their dams. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, when the filtration plant was built up at Morris Lake, the dam at Morris Lake was basically rebuilt at that time. 
plus a couple of years later uh, on the filtration plant side of the dam, uh, there was what they call articulated concrete mat placed so that in the event of what they call the probable maximum flood, if that did overtop, it would help to stabilize and uh, help the abutment of the dam stay in place so we didn't have a failure like that. Mm -hmm. So along those lines, uh, dam sites number two and number three. Dam site number two is the one we just got done with off of uh, Sportswood, Sportswood Road. It's the one back by Glen Terrace. That one, you had uh, basically reinforced, raised it about a foot roughly uh, in different spots and also installed the concrete, basically a concrete retaining wall beneath the grade in the emergency spillway. What the uh, soil conservation uh, had found over the years was with an earthen spillway like that, if you did have a sustained flood situation, you could work on eroding that. So what the reinforced wall did was basically if it did cut off the first six inches to a foot or whatever over the concrete wall, that would start to become a concrete weir and it would help to eliminate and minimize the impact of the dam as far as eroding the dam. The other thing that we did, dam site number three, uh, that is the one above or right next to the ball field for discussion purposes between Mill Street and Plus Road up in that quadrant of the county, prop, county college property. Mm -hmm. Both of those areas, we didn't, if you'll recall, we didn't do anything with the valves and the low, low level outlets. The reason we didn't do that is because that was kind of a specialty item with the divers as opposed to the concrete contractors and what have you. And we didn't want to open up those valves and end up in a situation where, okay, we opened it, now we can't close mm -hmm. it, now what are we going to do? So just like we did at dam site number four several years ago, that's the one above Horton's Pond, we actually had the divers go down, locate the end of the low outlet pipe, blow it and jet away so that we knew we weren't going to bring a lot of debris and clog up the pipe and or the valve and cause a worse problem, mm -hmm. if you will. And then as necessary, in that particular case, had to put new valves in for the low-level outlet. When we had the divers over to dam sites number two and number three, their recommendation was let's find the ends of the pipe, put the necessary screening on the end, exercise the valves, and we may be able to use everything that you've got there right now. It's more of a case right now, I think, it hasn't been used in so long. Mm. To put in perspective, those dam control, flood control projects were built in the late 50s, early 60s, so it's been 50, 60, 70 years, whatever. So it's been a long time since they've been operated. But I think uh, they thought with, with some work on uh, exercising them and replacing parts as necessary, may be able to put it back in service, and especially with the screened end so that it can be exercised uh, on an annual basis and not be so concerned about having something opened up that you can't close again. And we came up with work total for that of about $100,000. Uh, number seven for the year 2025, dam site number three, structural sill in the emergency spillway. Again, that's that underground concrete retaining wall reinforced that we talked about that you did in dam site number four above Horton's Pond this past year, two years ago, whatever it was, up on Swartzwood Road. This is the last one that you've got. It's the one above the ball field or next to the ball field by Plots and Mill Street. Uh, and based on what we've seen, and that's the smallest one of the group, mm -hmm. one of the smallest, I should say. And based on what we had for projects in other areas along this line, we figured that'd be about a $100,000 project. Then finally, for 2026 to 2029, fire hydrant valve replacement and repair. <laughs> Remember, I said uh, uh, at the beginning of this discussion, that there was an asset management plan going on. And it's basically, if I had to guess, and I'd let Joe talk about this, but probably about 20% done right now or so uh, to be confirmed. But there's a lot more valves and a lot more things to check out along these lines. So basically, we want to put some funds in there for that because we're talking 10 years out for that. Things break, things wear out and especially along the transmission lines to keep them going. I know they're walking them and locating them. Years ago, we did a GIS map of all these valves and went yeah. through it, but it's something you gotta continuously work on. Uh, every time you think you found something or know where everything is, you find something else. Mm -hmm. So that's why we put some funds in at the end. I think that rounded out to about $500,000.
504 mm -hmm. for a total of all those projects of about a million three. There's a lot that goes into turning on the faucet and flushing the toilets. Yes, ma'am. Um, <laughs> uh, and not having to worry about it on your own property. Um, any additional comments to David's report from Joe? Okay, anything? Okay. Questions um, from the council? Dan, any comments from your end? I mean, I think different um, than Fred's report, David, is that um, yours we've been talking about pretty actively, many of these projects. Yes. Um, over the last couple of years. Yes. Um, even the, you know, the existing capital improvement budgets, um, in the current budget, future budget, et cetera. Um, so I know some of this sounds familiar to council. Do you have any comments from your end? I think... You know, none of this stuff was a, a real shocker to me, obviously, because the dialogue's been going on. I didn't know about the Montana crossing area of the Glen. But the thing that, that concerns me is the, um, I guess it's like the finite, like, plumbing parts inside the, uh, what, beside, inside the treatment plant, and, like, how long those are poised to last for, because I know I, the, the plant's, like, what, seven years old now 18 years old okay. along this along the same lines like, right yeah I mean like I, I just don't I don't know what the what the schedule is for for that and how long that plumbing is is supposed to last I know we do paint it and but I know there is corrosion that occurs um, I, I think one one major component and I let Joe speak to this but uh, I think one major component are the membrane filtration units themselves and my understanding is, and I stand corrected from Joe, uh, that every year you're putting funds away for the eventual replacement of those units. I thought we were actually, were we physically replacing a couple at a time or no? I think that they didn't think it was feasible to do one at a time. We should just try to do the whole thing as, as a whole. Batching because it? If oh, you, the whole thing. If you replace one train, that's going to get the majority of the flow because they're brand new. That's right. You're reminding me of this conversation. You'd want to do all three, so you kind of space it out to you're replacing everything at one time. Which is why we've been putting away money every year <coughs> yes. in the capital improvement on the water water sewer side. But aside from the filters, like the the nuts and bolts of the plumbing system inside that place, because I know I've been in there many many times. Yeah. And there's so that's that's in good condition. It's just wearing and tearing it at a normal. It's basically the, the, the moisture on the inside is just putting the rust and corrosion, you know, a little bit of rust on the outside of the pipes that need to be sandblasted or thing and painted. That's what basically needs to be done with that. But we just replaced one of the compressors, a you know, brand new compressor. We're working on upgrading other stuff. You know, it's just a process. But as of right now, everything's running fine. Okay. Will the Good. asset That's management great. plan also outline? Um, the probable life of the assets like in other words you know will there be a detail of here are the components and then here's the, the projected useful life well that's that's one of the things that they basically in that asset management plan are staging that in over time the different components of it for example the, the first component or one of the first components was a mapping of your system so right. you know what you've got and Newton was ahead of the curve on that because as I mentioned earlier you had us do a GIS map of the whole thing, the whole distribution system from Morris Lake all the way to mm -hmm. Old Town <laughs> Newton. So we were ahead of the game on that one. Now that we're doing the inventory part and the exercising, they're making notes on the condition and the type of hydrant and what have you and its approximate age. Then as we develop the plan, you can develop a plan to schedule some of that information for replacement, mm -hmm. which is why in the end we had that $504,000, mm -hmm. because by the time you get to that point in time, you should have most of that information. So the other thing I'll add is because someone might say, well, why are we re-inventorying and re, you know, why don't we already have this information? So I would, I, and I would go so far as to say, up until about 10 or 15 years ago, the records that were kept previous um, were handwritten records or um, many different maps. Many yeah, different maps, um, different, just different types of ways that the records were kept. And I think that's been streamlined over the last decade for the planning 
content of infrastructure repairs and updates Correct. upgrades. Um, Correct. So the going forward will be much more informed as to, that's why I asked about the usual life, like, you know, here's this piece of equipment, projected age, useful life, well, you know, deferred maintenance, existing maintenance. Yep, you're exactly right. And one of the things that's on the mapping, it's just not a straight line diagram of the pipes where they are schematically in the valves, but also they're color coded and they have what they call metadata on them, which basically says it's a ductile iron pipe, it's a cast iron pipe, it's four inches, it's 20 inches mm -hmm. diameter. You've got information that if all of a sudden, poof, everybody in the water department left, you've got a map that shows you basically what's going on. Uh, well, the other thing that's done is it's informed the guys when we do have a leak or a break, you know, where they're starting to dig in, what they should expect to find down there and so we know before we even open up the road equipment manpower estimated costs those types of things and I, I know many of us have been out on those sites when you guys are um, trying to repair a, a break and you guys have said that it's great to have the information um, because you always didn't know what you were opening the ground to part of that and it is like they said as Dustin and Jason are out there doing this they've already found three valves that weren't on anything that we had. So that's the advantage to this too at the same time. And plus, like you said, with the new system that we have, um, they went to do a mark out um, and they couldn't find a valve, but they were looking at their tablet and it was saying, geez, according to GPS, it should be right here. Mm -hmm. So they cut into the road and lo and behold, it was right there. Directly right where Dustin was standing, but oh. underneath the black tops. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always work that way. Does I know. <laughs> it's good when it does, though. That was one of those ones that was nice. He couldn't believe it. But uh, when before, like you said, and still in some of the stuff, we have to literally, and some of the stuff's no longer there, measure off of a curb, measure off of somebody's front mm -hmm. porch, take diagonals and everything else like that, and the hope, like you just said, with the GPS, that hopefully... It's you know, there when you do it up. You know, because somebody could take it okay, this is a 45 degree angle, I'm standing at 47, I'm three feet off or something like that. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so there is um, a lot of advantages to it. Like as Dave said, we are finding things that we didn't know were there. Mm -hmm. so. Dan, more questions? Councilman Diglio, any questions for David? No, any questions. I was looking at the financing. I looked at all the projects that uh, for 2020, mm -hmm. thinking budget-wise, because we're going to be doing that very soon. And I was looking at the combination between the water and the sewer. And I don't think we have any problem with coming up with a million dollars. I told before, four million two hundred thirteen thousand dollars in projects that would need to be done in 2020 for both water and sewer. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we're going to have to seriously think about. Well, and the biggest hit is that is the pump station on Sparta Avenue, the which pump. we've been talking about now for a while and um, the conditions that are there are just I mean, forget the age of it it's just they're not so it's, it's unsafe yeah. um, which is our which is the biggest concern every time one of the guys has to go out there you're concerned about safety um, plus if if there was an emergency there what that would do to the rest of the system so um, that's definitely the biggest that's which is probably why Fred put it as number one not mm -hmm. surprising Sandy, anything, any other questions? Other than that, no. Councilman Schlaffer? Right. Councilman Dixon. Mm, just with the valves, are we also just being proactive with when we have road projects opening up? You know, if there's any that need to be replaced in that area at that time, taking care of yeah, that? That's what we're always making those yeah. suggestions. Yeah, okay. I figured that, but I wanted to ask. All right. Um, and then the, the one dam. Uh, off Sportswood. Are we concerned with any sort of uh, construction anywhere else that it's going to increase storm flow uh, to that pot potentially? You know, one thing that's come up over the years, the DEP has been very involved with stormwater regulations and how you have to handle storm drainage. Uh, for example, when a development goes in, it used to be they put a detention basin or some sort of underground structures in to detain water just so that the 100-year storm, for example, didn't come off of the property any faster than what it does now. But under today's rules and regulations, it's not only keeping the status quo, mm -hmm. depending on 
depending on the storm frequency, you've actually got to reduce the rate of flow coming off the property. Mm -hmm. okay. So between that, recharge and water quality, there's a lot of constraints that go in that help keep the status quo, if you will, or in fact reduce it. Mm -hmm. So okay. from that standpoint, it's, it's a good question because a lot of times, especially if it's in a municipality outside your limits, you can't necessarily control what's happening, but they have to control it by virtue of the new stormwater regulations. Okay. And the DEP, uh, when we do the annual inspections of the dams, there's one of the inspection uh, report questions. Has there anything happened upstream or downstream that would change the classification of this dam or anything that you should note? And if anything changes, excuse me, we note it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions from students? I'm going to also ask you to stay around for a second public. That's yes, okay. No problem. In case there's questions. All right. At this time, I'm um, going to do an intermission. Um, Lorraine, at 8:40. That's okay. Five-minute intermission. Back at 8:45. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll make. When we go back on the record, I'll. Thank you. 
They only sell them in Vermont? Um, I don't know. No. But huh? literally from the store he used to get them. Hello. Okay. Hello. Where have you been? No, no, no. I mean. Oh. <laughs> Shelburne. Shelburne Country Store. Oh, okay. Because it's a place called Vermont Country Store. Yeah. All no. Uh, uh, there's like 50 different kinds of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. 
At the multiple meeting process. Okay, that's what I kind of figured. Have you tried them? Yep. Yeah. But like lately. I know you did, but I'm asking okay. you to recently. Lorraine, are you ready? Right, it's disappointing. Lorraine, you ready? Yes. I'm going to make a note for the record. Okay. I come back. Okay, Tom, are you ready? All right. We're back from executive at 8.50. Um, and for the record, just noting that Deputy Mayor Flynn had to uh, leave for the rest of the meeting. All right, so we're going to go into ordinances. Uh, we have a public hearing and a second reading on Ordinance 2019-10. This is an ordinance amending Chapter 289, Towing of the Code of the Town of Newton to amend Sections 289-4.A, Rates for Towing Services, to include a comprehensive schedule of services. Um, so since we have that uh, public hearing tonight, I need a motion to open the hearing. I'll make a motion to open the hearing on Ordinance 2019-10. I have a motion to open the uh, ordinance to a hearing by Councilwoman Diglio and a second by Councilman Dixon. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Do we have any comments or questions on that ordinance? Okay, seeing none, I need a motion to close. I'll make a motion to close the hearing of the public. And I'll second the motion. I have a motion by Councilman Dixon, a second by Councilman Schlaffer to close the hearing of the public. All in favor? Aye. And I need a uh, motion to act. I will make a motion to act on Ordinance 2019-10. I'll second the motion. I have a motion by Councilwoman Diglio and a second by Councilman Schlaffer. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Dixon? Yes. Mrs. Diglio? Yes. Mr. Schlaffer? Yes. Mayor LaFoy? Yes. All right. No other ordinances for public hearing or second reading. We'll move on to ordinances for introduction. We have Ordinance 2019-11. Dash 11. This is an ordinance revising sections 20 3.b and 3 50.c2 of the Code of the Town of Newton regarding low SAP contributions. Do I have a motion to introduce the ordinance? I make a motion to introduce Ordinance 2019 11. I'll second. I have a motion by Councilman Schlaffer and a second by Councilman Dixon to introduce Ordinance 2019 11. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Dixon? Yes. Diglio? Yes. Mr. Schlaffer? Yes. Mayor LaFoy? Yes. Um, yes. Sandy, you have to recuse. Sandy has to recuse yeah. on that. You get the low set benefit, so you have to recuse on this one. We close on the introduction or actually we close on the okay. Yeah, because, oh, uh, right, you receive the low set benefit through first aid. Yeah. Gotcha, okay. Uh, so you'll change the record, then, Lorraine, on that? I, I will. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, we have uh, introduction, introduction of Ordinance 2019-12. This is a fully funded water sewer capital improvement ordinance in the amount of $40,000 for acquisition of a water, so water sewer utility truck in the town of Newton County of Sussex, New Jersey. I'll make a motion to introduce Ordinance 2019-12. I'll second that motion. I have a motion by Councilman Schlaffer and a second by Councilwoman Diglio. A roll call vote, please. Mr. Dixon? Yes. Diglio? Yes. Mr. Schlaffer? Yes. Mayor LaFoy? Yes. And finally, Ordinance 2019 13. This is an ordinance appropriating $50,000 from the capital fund balance for the 2011 Recreational Trail Grant Program Project in and by the Town of Newton <coughs> in the County of Sussex, New Jersey. I'll make a motion and introduce Ordinance 2019 13. Second. I have a motion by Councilman Schlaffer, a second by Councilman Dixon to introduce Ordinance 2019 13. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Dixon? Yes. Mrs. Diglio? Yes. Yes. Mayor yes. That is it for our ordinances for tonight. So the three ordinances that were introduced will then be on the next meeting for public hearing and second reading. We have no old business, so we'll move on to the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and non-controversial by the Town of Newton or by the Town Council and will be approved by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member so requests, in which case the item will be removed from the consent agenda and considered in its normal sequence on the agenda. Mr. Russo, can you go through the consent? Sure. Uh, resolution 212 is a Chapter 159 for the Rail Trail $24,000 grant. Resolution 213, Water Sewer Credits. 214 is cancellation of the 40,000 Gardner Well uh, 
canceling that into the fund. Uh, resolution 215, capital budget amendment, $40,000, water sewer truck, utility truck, which references back to ordinance 2019-12. Mm -hmm. We have two leaf payouts, one for Dawn, one for Jimmy Cisco. We have the 50,000 rail trail grant insertion, which ties back to to ordinance 2019-13, and then we have bills and vouchers, resolution 219. Any uh, of the resolutions required to be pulled for further comment, question, discussion? No. No? All right, seeing none, I'll uh, entertain a motion for the consent agenda. I'll make a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda. And I'll second the motion. I have a motion by Councilman uh, Dixon and a second by Councilman Schlaffer to accept the consent agenda. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Dixon? Yes. Dick Leo? Yes, but I need to exclude um, on check 42285. So you are recusing from check 42285? Yes. And that's in ordinance uh, 2019, resolution 2019 2019. Mr. Schlaffer? Yes. Mayor yes. Okay. That's it for the consent agenda. We'll move on, move on to discussion. Mr. Russo? Yeah, just uh, it's that time of year where the state uh, sends us the best practices inventory questionnaire. So we've worked on that at the staff level. We've submitted it. I just wanted to note that for the record that we've exceeded the requirements of the state once again. So I want to thank Dawn, uh, other staff and professionals. Our score was 44. You needed a score of 30 plus to make sure that there was no state aid withholding. So we far exceeded the score that we needed. Obviously, we do things the right way here. And mm -hmm. that's a reflection uh, of that it comes across through the best practices inventory. And then as part of the inventory, there's a question that I just have to reference, question 33 talks about uh, authorities and obviously we have the parking authority and at the staff level we've evaluated annually the parking authority that has been created by the town and our findings and conclusions uh, address whether the parking authority continues to serve the public interest which we find that it does and that um, it's the most efficient um, opportunity for us to maintain public parking and provide the services and financing for public facilities um, so Lorraine will reference this discussion uh, into the record, into the minutes, so that we can reference it for the best practices. Mm -hmm. The only thing I'll note is that the finances of the parking authority are very strong. Um, you know, revenues are up. It's being maintained very efficiently. And for the first time since I've been here, we are looking at acquiring property mm -hmm. in and near the downtown to add additional parking to facilitate commerce in the downtown. And, you know, it's the first time that we've had to do that in the 12 years that I've been here. And, so, and that's part of the, exciting that part of the parking analysis that I referenced earlier yes. that we're uh, looking at those needs. And I know that's being done with um, Parking Authority in conjunction with your team, Tom. Um, we've, meant, we've, we've talked about the best practices that the state puts out um, either through the audit process. Dawn has talked about it on the financial metrics side. Um, it's not the only um, inventory questionnaire that comes from the state. Um, so it's nice that since the state started implementing these a number of years ago, that Noon's always scored higher than the minimum required amount, which, as you indicated, does directly impact uh, the level of state funding that we that we receive, which is a budgeted item, um, which helps to keep uh, the tax level where it's at. So, um, you know, you re you reference question you reference question thirty three, but there's a lot of questions, not only in that best practice question. A questionnaire but others that you know aren't simple yes or no questions it questions the processes and the and the policies and the infrastructure that's in place within the town to make sure you're doing what the state wants you to do and if you don't have those things in place then it usually requires another another layer potentially of bureaucracy or whatever but so it's nice that when we can we can report back that um, we're exceeding the state's required <coughs> minimum recommendations, and I say recommendations in air quotes because they're really mandates that come from the state, many of which are unfunded mandates, right? Mm -hmm. So they te they say that the municipalities have to act and perform in a certain way, but there's not, you know, financing, funding, or resources that come from the state level oftentimes to implement those practices. So um, another thank you to Dawn and the team, uh, you and the Parking Authority for helping us to exceed that, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, so we'll note that for the record. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. All right, at this time we'll reopen the meeting to the public um, for any topic, including uh, perhaps some questions that might be as a result of the two presentations we had tonight. Any additional public comments? Peggy Baldini, uh, Barry Lane. Um, I did have a question regarding the capital water and sewer project. You mentioned that it's about $4 million in 2020 alone. Do you have a total for the whole 10 year project? Well, I'll, yeah, it's, I'll, I'll answer. Go that ahead. Okay. Okay. Well, no, no, okay. No, no. Yeah. Also, I have a prepared statement. Um, I was contacted by a group of concerned citizens who um, realized that Mr. Russo's contract is up, and um, so I have this prepared statement. <clears throat> it's entitled, uh, "In our opinion, we can do better." Um, we appreciate Mr. Russo's service, as he has been contracted with the. Uh, New, Town of Newton as manager for about 10 years. Um, his contract is ending December 31st, and currently we submit to the elected officials of the Newton Town Council a request to review and amend the town manager's contract. The town manager's contract should require that he or she be a resident of the Town of Newton, so that the decisions made in this position will affect the person making them. Um, we we need someone in this office that will contribute to the community and be here on a daily basis. In addition, we would like the salary requirements for this position uh, to be more appropriate and in keeping with the current economic conditions of Sussex County. This is a 2.5 square mile town and Mr. Russo's salary is close to what the governor makes. Um, <coughs> We no longer have confidence that the town manager is working in the best interests of our community. We request that you do not renew Mr. Russo's contract. Um, and we have examples. Um, but um, so we believe that the, um, the Newton Public Swimming Pool was mishandled. Um, now we have to pay exorbitantly to fix it. It had a leaking valve for years and nothing was done to fix it. The prior replastering of the pool was poorly done and no action was taken regarding that. So the pool has been closed for a year and he also has stated that he wants to destroy the bathrooms in Memory Park. Um, Mr. Russo called people who allegedly vandalized the bathrooms animals in a public meeting on September 23rd. Um, and these are people who deserve respect no matter what their situation is. Um, this comment shows a general disrespect for the people who live and work here. Even if these persons are disadvantaged or troubled in some way, there is no reason to treat them in this manner, and it is unacceptable. Um, there's a steady increase in property taxes um, due to some of the things that have happened while he's been in office, like the pilots, um, and according to Mr. Russo, we are now at 35% tax exempt properties in this town. There's been a steady decline in retail businesses on Newton's um, Spring Street with an increase in crime and the police force. Um, we came in $1 million over budget on the Newton Firehouse Project. And there's general overspending of taxpayer dollars. So the statement at the end is that we can do better um, we can do better than Thomas Russo, whose salaries and benefits combined are closer to the salary range of the governor. Um, while we struggle to make ends meet in Sussex County, Mr. Russo lives out of county and shows up in the office a few times per week, driving a car we pay for with our tax dollars. We deserve a town manager that respects Newton residents enough to consider new ideas and we can do better for our town and our community. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. 
Mekaj, 9 Madison Street. Regarding resolution number 220-2019, Mrs. Snellen, Mrs. Baldini, Mr. Hoffman spoke the voice of many members of our community, and I am one of them. When major things in our town not only do not show improvement in a period of 10 years, but go in an opposite direction, then is the time for all of you who represent us, who represent community, our community, to really, really ponder, ponder your thoughts and make the right decision for town manager's annual review. Personally, but that is personally, I support the two terms contract, no more. I'm sure Mr. Rousseau has tried his best in our town, but trying is not enough. We need results, and we are due for it. Thank you. Any other public comments this time? Nope. <coughs> okay, seeing none, we'll close that portion of the meeting. And we'll go on to additional counselor and manager comments. Reverse order, Mr. Dixon. No. Mr. Schlager? Not Schlager. at this time. Mr. Russo? Sure. A um, couple things. One, as far as Ms. Baldini goes, water sewer. So the process, uh, you know, we've been working on this for about six months. So I want to thank Kenny and Joe and Fred and Dave, although I have to be honest, I like Dave's numbers better than Fred's. Yeah, they're no lower. respect, but <laughs> your numbers were better. Um, but, you know, we've been working on this for about six months. So the process, Peggy, is that take these numbers, um, budget submittals by the department heads are due by Thursday. I will work with the new CFO. I'm putting together the budget for November, December. Council will receive it in January, February, and we have to tie all the numbers together. So it's, it's very preliminary, but some version of these projects and numbers will make their way into the capital budget that we do next year. Um, so what the total cost will be, you know, you have the numbers, you saw the reports, they're public record, you can get copies from Lorraine. But most likely these projects will be a, a part of the capital budget in some fashion. Um, but keep in mind that we're trying to pay things with cash and water and sewer and not bond or borrow funds. So there might have to be some tweaking, but in general, these are the projects. And I just wanted the council to, you know, kind of have a few months uh, up to speed on this because you know these are big numbers and we're, we're maintaining a public water and sewer infrastructure that's very dated but very su substantial and very important because it's the thing that attracts a lot of developers to the town is the fact that we have infrastructure and we have capacity so we have to you know be very cautious and cognizant of the infrastructure Appreciate the comments about my contract. My contract's public record. I enjoy serving at the pleasure of the council, but I just need to correct some of the comments that Peggy had. As far as residency, um, residency was very popular for managers and administrators in the 1970s and 80s. It's not really something that you find very often. Some do. You know, some managers and administrators do live in the towns that they serve. Most don't. Um, but residency is something that really hasn't been um, part of most contracts of the past 10, 20 years. Salary is commensurate with experience and the quality of the work. Um, as far as the pool, um, yeah, it was, it was unfortunate that we had to close the pool, but the reality wasn't, wasn't a safe condition, and I, I don't make apologies for the fact that I was the one who said we need, really needed to look under the hood to make sure if we were going to put additional funds into the pool that we did it the right way. I don't regret that. I am sad that we missed a pool season, but if we get 20 good pool seasons going forward out of it, it was worth it because safety is paramount and obviously doing things cost-effective would be a close second. I don't 
tracked my comments about the bathrooms when you have people defecating on the floors and throwing feces around the walls and pulling sinks off the walls. Those are not humans, those are animals. Um, they don't show respect for public property that you're, you're all paying for as taxpayers, so I call a spade a spade, and I wish they would behave differently, but I'm sorry when people are defecating, not in the toilet, but everywhere else in, in the public restroom, I have a problem with that, and I think as taxpayers, you should really have a problem with that too. Taxes, we had almost no increase this past year. It was the best budget since I've been here and probably the best budget the town has had in, since its inception. Pilots, the council, 5-0, is in support of pilots. So these five people I report to support pilots. It's my job to implement them. You can ad agree or disagree, but my job is to implement the will of the governing body, and all five of them support pilots. Tax exempts, the number is the same now as it was when I started. I don't create tax exempts, if you all recall. Uh, a few years ago, I sent letters to all the tax exempt properties, and I got a nice target on my back because they didn't appreciate the fact that I was asking them to support all of you as taxpayers, but I did it because it was the right thing to do. And, you know, it was my negotiations that got money out of Atlantic Health with Newton Medical Center, and that became a model that they've used for other hospitals. Uh, I don't agree with the crime statistics that you've referenced, overspending. There is no overspending. The Council, I propose a budget, the council approves it, we meet the budget. Obviously, the council and the public sees the fund balance increasing to the largest level it's been since the town has been here, and, and that's because we don't overspend. We monitor our expenses, we have funds left over, and that, those funds go into fund balance, hence why we had the best uh, budget this past year that we've ever had. Firehouse is on track. There were change orders that the council authorized. Those were part of the $2 million, or actually 1.9 and change. Those were budgeted, so those were those were not unforeseen. And once again, we've met the budget. We didn't exceed the budget, so I just wanted to correct the record on those items. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Any other comments? One last time. I would like to make a comment because they have referenced Tom's salary several times and benefits. However, they don't even consider that we have a superintendent who does an excellent job, who monitors three schools and roughly 1,300 students, and his salary, I believe, is approximately $25,000 more than what Tom is making, and he just had another increase. So I'm a little concerned that they target one person and yet at the same time are not looking at what's going on down at the Board of Education. I am concerned about that because that does make it more difficult for, the, for us when it comes to a town manager who is in charge of an entire town and a population anywhere from eight to 23,000 people during the day and all the facilities of the town. So that is the one concern I have, that people are not looking at both places at the same time because what happens down at the board makes it a little bit more difficult for us here at the council. Okay, anything else, Councilman yeah, DeGleo? Councilman Schaffer, Councilman Dixon? Okay, so on the agenda we have uh, executive session. We have resolution 220-2019. This is a resolution providing for a meeting not open to the public in accordance with the provisions of the New Jersey Open Public Meeting Act, NJSA 10 colon 4-12. Uh, item I, item one, personnel, town managers, annual review. I need a motion to go into executive. Motion to go into executive meeting. I will second that motion. I have a motion by uh, Councilman Schaffer and a second by Councilwoman Diglio to go into executive session at 9.13 p.m.